Deuteronomy 32 and 9, for the most highest portion is his people. Jacob is the allotted of his inheritance. Jeremiah 10 and 16, the portion of Jacob is not like them. For he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. Ahia is his name. Isaiah 43 and 21, this people have I formed for myself. And what shall they do? They shall show forth my praise. Do not let the righteous do careful with our food, baby, that's his prayer. Study to show ourselves a rule, steady on the food, baby, that's his prayer. Strata in the fix, some of that little bit of this thing is real. We ain't doing none of that, and don't know who was that just trying to keep it holy. Shalom, 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 beloved. This is Brother Obadiah uh, coming to you again. It's an honor, it's, a, it's always a privilege to be before the Most High's children. Uh, we're going to continue with uh, Apostle Shaul's Israelite letters. This is part two of Apostle Shaul's Israelite letters. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to see part one, of this series, I recommend that you stop now and go to our um, thank you. Go to our YouTube channel, Tour Group uh, Twelve on YouTube, and have a look at Part One. Uh, it's broken down into Part A, B, C, and D. In that first segment, we give you the missing Israelite history to understand this series. We showed you in that part in Part One of this series how. Our Hebrew ancestors became known as Greeks, and they also became known as Romans. So without that, that piece of information, the rest of this uh, lesson or series is going to be totally, totally Greek to you. So I recommend, if you haven't watched part one of Shaul's Israelite Letters, stop now and go watch part one. Because now we're just going to go even further into Apostle Shaul's letters, and we're going to show you the details and the phrases of his letters can only pertain to the nation of Israel. And also today we're going to get into some uh, original root Hebraic words and show you that the entire New Testament, Apostle Paul and the other uh, few letters by other uh, disciples, they're all toward the Israelite nation. So we got a lot of ground to cover. So before we get into it, let's offer up some praise to our Father, and then we get to the lesson. Almighty God, we come before you, thanking you for another day of blessing, Father, another day of Georgia. We come before you, Father, and offer up praise and glory to your throne and to your nation, Father. We thank you for keeping your covenant to the nation of Israel, Father. We thank you for waking up the remnant in the last days, Father. As we present today, Father, we ask that you let these words, let your words, Father, penetrate the ears of your children and bring them back to you by the blood of our King, the Messiah, the Lamb of the Lamb of Yah, the Lion of Judah, Father. We ask that you take this, Father, and you present it to those that you have chosen, Father. Without you, Father, we're dumb dogs. We're blind, Father. We need you. We commit this study to you right now in the name of our King, by the blood of Yeshua. Let the children of Yah say Amen. Amen. So. We have a lot, a lot to go over, but first, I, I always tell people when you're studying scripture, context is king. You have to keep things in context. So if you had a great e a reading teacher in first or second grade, as I did, you ought to think, write that teacher a lesson uh, or a letter if they're still living, because without reading comprehension, everything is just Greek to everybody. And what I mean by that, I'll give you a perfect example. I'm going to read to you something that's a famous, a famous quote. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, 
and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I just read to you the second paragraph that became known as the Constitution of the United States. And it's a very, very famous quote. But this man says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, apparent, that all men were created equal. Now, he says all men were created equal, but this document was written in 1776. And we know in 1776, the Hebrew Israelite nation that had made it to the United States, they were in chains. They were cattle. They were merchandise. So when this man said that all men were created equal in 1776, it's obvious he wasn't talking about the Hebrew Israelites that were in this country, nor was he talking about the aboriginal Hebrew that became known as the American Indian, because they were slaughtering them by the thousands to take over their land. So when he says all men were created equal, you have to keep it in context. He said all men were created equal but he was speaking of men of his nation. He was speaking of those British men who came over here to get to break away from England. He wasn't talking about the Hebrew uh, slave, nor was he talking about the Hebrew Indian. So you have to keep things in, in context, and it's the same thing when we read the Bible. So we introduced last week, the church taught us that Apostle Paul sent letters to strange nations to these born-again Christians. Well, we're going to continue to show you by examining the details of his language that Apostle Paul was sending his letters to the scattered Israelite nation. And that, that example I just gave you with the Constitution, we could do it over and over again with the Bible. Uh, for instance, one of the famous uh, scriptures that's often uh, glossed over inside the church is... Um, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then they stop right there. But if you look that scripture up, I believe it's in uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 5. If you continue on, the writer or Solomon says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then he says, because they forsake the law. So when you cherry pick scriptures and don't put things in context, you're totally lost. So, uh, 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 a Hebrew mind, I would say an educated Hebrew would say, well, let's slow things down. When he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, who is my people? Well, if you examine the scriptures, my people always refers to the nation of Israel. And then he says, and he follows up with, because they forsake the law. The law or the Torah or the instructions of the Almighty was only given to the Israelite nation. That's how you got to keep things in the context when you read these scriptures. You just can't go all willy-nilly and put these scriptures on everybody. So before I get too far gone, let me give my disclaimer as always. Uh, I want to be fair and transparent. If you esteem the words of a man, whether it be your pastor, bishop, your deacon, your first lady, if you esteem the words of a man over the words of the Most High, then you might want to exit this presentation. If you have a problem with reading verses out of the Bible verbatim with no performances, meaning no hooping and hollering, no running and shouting, this may be boring to you and you may want to exit the presentation. Uh, if you only open your Bibles or even touch your Bible on SU in morning, Sunday morning, this presentation is not for you and you, you might want to exit the presentation. We're going to take a look at the ancient writings of our Hebrew ancestors and we're going to show you how Apostle Paul was sending his letters. Today we're going over Romans to scatter Hebrew Israelites that were going by names such as Gentiles and Romans. So I want to share with you some uh, forgotten history. For those of you out there who actually take the time to research, this is a, a great resource to have. This is a, a author, and he's a Hebrew author, J.A. Rogers. This is a book by J.A. Rogers, Nature Has No Color Line, or Nature Knows No Color Line. And I'm going to share with you a, a few facts to prove that people who look like me were living in the country of Rome 
and there wasn't a problem because they was dark. Discriminating against someone by their skin color is a modern evil. Originally, you were discriminated or hated because of your nation, because of your seat line, not because you were dark, but because of the nation you came from. So let me prove this to you. This is, uh, again, this is Nature, Nature Knows No Color Line by J.A. Rogers. And I'm going to read, this is on page, um, this is page 49. It says, finally, as opposed to instances of color aversion, are others showing none of it. Emperor Augustus used to relax from affairs of state by playing marbles with Moorish children. So next month on the Roman calendar is the month of August. It's named after one of their Caesars or one of their emperors, Augustus. J.A. Rogers just records that Augustus used to relax during his downtime by playing marbles with Moorish children. The term Moor is the first term that the Europeans use to describe dark people. First they used the term, I'm sorry, first they used the term Ethiopian, meaning burnt face. And then they, some of them started using the term more. So Augustus, the emperor or Caesar of Rome, used to chill and kick back by shooting marbles with children who looked like me. So this validates what we're saying that Hebrew Israelites, dark people, were living in the content of, oh, I mean, sorry, in the country of Rome. And these are the people that Apostle Paul is writing to in his letters. Let's continue on a couple more facts he says. Um, Moore was another name for Ethiop. Also, figures of ne Negroes appeared on cameos, bracelets, and other ornaments and were borne by the wealthy and wore on the ointment jars and other accessories on the dressing tables of grand dames. It's just a fact. It, it shows you that dark people were not hated always because of their skin. He drops down. He says, most important proof of all, however, is that the worship of a black goddess, Isis, was very popular in Rome. Arnobius Arno, Arno Afer, that is the African of the third century, wrote, Isis burnt black by the, I'm sorry, uh, Isis burnt black by the Ethiopian sons. Uh, it says, Isis, soon, soon there were shrines where, wherever Roman armies went. Traces of them have been found from Africa to Britain and from Spain to the Black Sea. So again, it lets you know that the Romans didn't hate us because we were dark. The Romans hated us because they knew what ancient kingdom the Israelites came from. The Romans actually worshiped a black goddess named Isis. If you Google um, the Vatican, you'll see the Pope kissing the black uh, the black Madonna and the black baby Yeshua or the, their version of the black Christ. So this thing about hating people for their skin color is moderate. It's moderate. The Romans were very familiar with us and they always dealt with us and they dealt with us in a loving manner. Let's continue on. He says, um, unions, licit and illicit between whites and blacks were as free in Rome as it is in Europe of our time. Always and everywhere, says Tinny Frank, a large part of the ore that furnished the material for race mixture was Oriental. A considerable part of the latter was Negro. So this, this racial, interracial, uh, uh, interracial breeding is nothing new. And the conflicts that come with it today, the discussion is nothing new. People were having the same discussion about interracial couples way back in ancient times. You had those who say, hey, it doesn't matter. And then you had those who say, it's unjust, it's impure. According to our scriptures, the Hebrew records say, racial intermarrying is illegal. No Hebrew should come in contact with another nation, whether it be a dark nation, such as the Ethiopians, or if it's a lighter nation, such as the Greeks and Romans. According to our records, according to our father, the Israelite nation were to stay to themselves. They were to take wives 
according to the tribes of their brothers. So this thing about interracial uh, dating is not new, but I'm showing you this to let you know that this is proof positive that dark-skinned people were living in Rome, and these dark-skinned people were the descendants of the Israelites who had ran to Rome to get away from the Greeks that invaded and were destroying and killing us. Let me read a few more that we will get into the lesson. Uh, it says, Lawful marriages took place between Romans and Ethiopians. Again, when they say Ethiopians, they're referring to the Hebrew Israelites who were living in Rome. He says, St. Jerome, in his famous uh, epistle, mentions the marriage of Romans to the Ethiopians. Again, they're calling everybody dark Ethiopians because Ethiopians is a, a, a term they adopted from the Greeks. The Romans just copied off the Greeks, and the Greeks called us Ethiopians or burnt face. So St. Jerome, who's one of their so-called uh, Christian founders of the Christian doctrine, he records in one of his lessons that there were marriages between Roman citizens, actually descendants of Rome, and these dark people are common. It's everyday occurrences. And these are the people Apostle Paul is writing to inside his epistles. I'm going to take a few more and, and um, we get to the lesson. Uh, okay, here's Julius Caesar. This is, if you just join him, I'm reading Nature Knows No Color Line by J.A. Rogers. This is a great resource to have if you don't have it. And this is page 53. I'm sorry, page 51. It says, Julius Caesar had a love affair with Uno, a Moorish queen, wife of King Bugadus of Morocco. So Julius Caesar had an affair with a Moorish queen. Again, the term Moor was just the first term used to describe black people. Julius Caesar had a love affair with a, a black woman. This thing is nothing new. And these are the people Apostle Paul is writing to that's living inside Rome. Um, it's just, this is untold history that's forgotten. And when you get to the scriptures, if you don't have this information, you're totally lost and confused and you'll continue to be bewildered by a false doctrine that says Apostle Paul went to win the other nations. Apostle Paul's mission was not to the other nations. So with that information, let, let's get into the lesson. This is Apostle Paul's Israelite letters, part two. And we're just going to take a closer look at the language and phrases Apostle Shaul or Apostle Paul is using to let you know that he knew he was talking to Hebrew Israelites and not real uh, Greeks or not real Gentiles or not real Romans. So let's start with the very first verse of Romans. Let's go to Romans 1 and 1. And right in the first five, uh, the five verses of, of Paul's introduction, it's a lot of meat. It's a lot of meat to digest. But when you're trained as a Greek student, it goes over your head. If you continue to read the Bible with a Greek mind, you're going to be totally lost. These phrases he's using are going to go over your head. So let's, let's read Paul's letter. This is to the Romans. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. He says, I'm called to be a servant, separated unto the gospel of God. So right then and there, if you don't understand the Hebrew customs, you're totally lost. This word gospel has given a lot of people some confusion. If you ask 10 different preachers what is the gospel, you're going to get 20 different answers. So Paul's telling you he's a servant called to be an apostle of the gospel of God. So what is the gospel of God? What is gospel? Well, the little known fact is the word gospel comes from a Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word, if you Google it, 
I got I hope you can see it here on the screen. If you go, if you pull up um, the blueletterbible.org, the blue letter Bible has tools where you can see the Hebrew words that was used of in, in the new translations. So the first Hebrew word we're going to go over is the word gospel. Well, the word gospel comes from the Strong's H1319, and it's again used in Strong's H1320. So if you can, Google Strong's H1319 and 1320. So gospel comes from the Hebrew word basar, B-A-S-A-R, basar. So if you go and look up the word basar inside the um, Hebrew lexicon, if you don't have a Hebrew lexicon, it's a great tool to have. Um, this, there's a man, I think his name is Jeff Brenner. Jeff Brenner did some awesome research with the Hebrew uh, language, the Hebrew um, culture, and uh, you can buy a hard copy of his lexicon. Uh, I get most of my books from Amazon because they're cheaper. But if you if you search the uh, Jeff Brenner's lexicon for the, the Hebrew word basar, you would get his lexicon number is twenty twenty five. Lexicon number 2025. And I hope you can see this. I don't want to move too much. But the Hebrew word basar in the original pictographs of the Hebrew language has three characters. This character is the B or the bet or the bet. This character is the Shamik, and this character is the Rosh. It's the head of a man. So this character for the letter B is the simple or, or the picture of a house or the, or the tent, the bottom of the tent showing you that this is, the, this is the, where the family resides. This is the letter B or this is the tent where the family resides. This is the letter Shamik right here, Shamik. And this is a picture of a thorn, a thorn or, 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 or briars that's used to enclose the animals and the sheep to protect the sheep from, uh, you know, invaders or looters and other animals. This last letter for Basar is, is uh, the head of a man, and they pronounce it as Rosh. So, with this information, we can break down the word Basar. So, the word that the, the Greeks use for Basar, they use gospel. But gospel goes back to the Hebrew word Basar, and you have the tent, you have some, some protection, and you have the head of a man. So the Greek mind can't understand what, what these pictures mean. Well, anytime a Hebrew got good news, good news was a reason to party. Good news was a reason to celebrate. So anytime you got some good news, your wife was pregnant, your son was made of that from his travel, uh, we won the war, that was good news, that was good tidings. And what do we do when we got good news? We party. We have a feast. So when you take a look at these at these pictures, gospel or basar means to have a feast. And what do you need to have a feast? Well, if you're going to have a feast, especially you know how it's dark people like to do, you need meat. You need flesh. So that's what the Hebrew word basar means. Basar means flesh. So when you when you go to the New Testament. And you hear them using the word gospel, even though the Greek mind think the gospel means good news for everyone, the Hebrew mind says it's basar. Basar means flesh because we're having a party because we got good news. So the first time you can, you, you can find this word in the Bible is you, you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. You go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, and Adam saw his wife for the first time, and he says, this is flesh of my flesh. This is bone of my bone. Our father Adam says, this is basar. This is basar of my basar. So now they use the word basar in different contexts. Basar could mean a report, good news, but the origin of basar is flesh, bone. Now, how, do that, how does that equate to the gospel? Well, when we get to the New Testament, 
our Messiah said what? This is my body that I break for you. So to the Israelite, to the Hebrew, the good news or the Passover is the Messiah, Yahshua, has broken his body, has shed his flesh to bring us back to the Father. All praises to the Most High. This information goes over the head of the Greek student. They have no idea what the word gospel really means. So you can find some more examples of this if you turn to the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 27. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. And then the most famous one is Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. When Isaiah says, Behold, I preached. You know what? Let me get it. Let me get it because I know how the uh, I know how the internet gurus are. So let me read it to you verbatim. Let me read it to you verbatim. We're going to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Because I don't want to put my words in your mouth. I want you to hear the most highest words. So this is Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. And Isaiah is speaking for the Most High, and this is actually a prophecy. He says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So to the Hebrew, he says, the Ruach of Elohim, or Almighty Yahuwah, is upon me. Because Yahuwah have anointed me to preach good tidings. Good tidings right there is covered with one word for the Hebrew, and it's Basar. He has anointed me to preach good tidings or basar. He says, he has uh, anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Hallelujah for the blood of Yeshua, of Yeshua, who has redeemed the house of Israel. Now, in Christianity, they take this and they run with it and have church with it, but they don't understand what it means when the Messiah repeated this. The Messiah repeated this when he started his ministry. And, and inside the Greek mind, this is, he's going to preach good tidings to all those who are brokenhearted, to everybody's in prison. So into the Greek mind, if you're without Christ, you're in prison. You're in bondage to uh, this, you're in bondage to that. And that sounds good, it sells a lot of concert tickets. It packs a lot of church houses. The problem is it doesn't match scripture. It doesn't match what this book is talking about. So I just read to you Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. And that's where the Messiah quoted when he came to start his ministry in the New Testament. Um, I didn't have it marked, but for those of you who may be new, I'll go to it and pull it up for you in the New Testament. So let's get it in the New Testament and show you how we put precept upon precept and line upon line. You just can't make a doctrine up off one verse. When these uh, so-called apologetics start cherry picking scriptures, that's what you get. You get a, a, empty, a empty religion, you get an empty doctrine. So we're gonna pull this up in the New Testament where Messiah said it when he came. And Messiah said it in Luke 4 and 18. So again, I go to it just for the sake of those who may be new to going through the Bible. So you go to Luke chapter 4 and 18, and Messiah said the same thing that Isaiah said, right? But today you're going to learn how to put it and make some sense to it. So in Luke 4 and 18, the Messiah has come and he says, let me start at verse 17. I'm reading from Luke chapter 4, verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now they use gospel because the New Testament was translated from a Greek manuscript. But our, ans our forefathers wouldn't use a Greek language because it's a, it's a slave language. Our Greek forefathers spoke Hebrew, and Hebrew says, he has anointed me to bring good tidings or basar. He says, to, uh, to, to the poor, 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are, are bruised. So, in Luke 4, 18, I'm sorry, in Luke 4, 17, it tells you the Messiah was handed the Isaiah scroll. And the Messiah read from the Isaiah scroll, right? So let's go back to Isaiah. And to get some understanding and let you know that the Messiah is only talking to the Israelites, let's go to Isaiah 1 and 1. Remember, context is key. The example we gave about the Constitution, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created equal. Well, in 1776, the Hebrew Israelites were slaves. So all men being created equal wasn't pertaining to the Israelites. So you have to keep things in context. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. So this is Isaiah's vision that he got from the Most High, right? So let's drop down. He says, Which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So Isaiah, the whole book of Isaiah is his vision that he saw concerning who? Judah and Jerusalem. Judah meaning the southern kingdom, Jerusalem uh, referring to the northern kingdom. So everything in Isaiah is only pertaining to the 12 tribes of Israel. So when you get to Isaiah 61 and he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me and then the Messiah says it in Luke 4 18, you can't put this on the whole world or everybody who's been converted to Christianity. It sounds good. It sells a lot of uh, concert halls. Today, many churches are packed, thinking that they're practicing the faith of the Messiah, but they're not. That's just one word, and we only covered the first verse in the book of Romans. Just with this information, Romans 1 and 1 takes on a whole new meaning. Romans 1 and 1 has a whole new meaning. Apostle Paul, or Shaul, knew who he was writing to. So, let's move on to Romans 1 and 2. Let's see if we get some more. Um, he says, let me find my, I should have used two Bibles. So, Romans 1 and 2. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So, verse 2 he says, he promised this, meaning to raise up men, apostles. He promised this by the prophets of the old times. Well, all the prophets came to the nation of Israel. All the prophets came to the nation of Israel. The Holy Scriptures only refers to the Old Testament. Holy Scriptures do not refer to any of the letters of the New Testament. That's how we put precept upon precept. Let's move on. Uh, verse 3. This is Romans 1 and 3. Concerning his son, Yeshua, Hamashiach, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. It says he was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Well, that's plain black and white. That's, that's not hard to understand. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to go to these, these cemetery schools to understand that. The Messiah came from the line or the seed of David, as promised by the as promised by all the prophets. He came from the line of David, from the seed of King David, from the seed of a man, as promised by the prophets. That's black and white. So everything that happened concerning him was from the Most High. The Most High is a spirit. The Most High is the Most High Spirit. That's why we call him the Most High. So the Most High Spirit sent his son in the flesh. His son came from the Most High Spirit. His son is spiritual. His seed of Israel is spiritual because the Most High Spirit separated the seed of Israel to be a people unto him. So although we're physical, we're the physical bloodline of Jacob, everything about us is spiritual because the Most High Spirit has separated us. That's where we get the word holy from. Holy comes from the Hebrew word kadosh or kadash, which means to be separated. We, the children of Israel, have been separated from the, from the other nations to be a holy nation. So just with these first three uh, verses of, of Romans, we get a whole new understanding of Paul's letters. He was sent, or he was raised up to be a servant of the gospel. 
this gospel is the basar. This basar is the flesh of the Messiah that the Messiah broke for the Hebrews. The Messiah says, this is my, this, this is, this is my body, I break for you. This is my flesh, I break for you. When, when the writer records that in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God, well, that word, that, that word became flesh. That flesh came in, in the form of our king. That king was sent to who? The nation of Israel. And Paul is writing to the lost nation of Israel. Let's continue on. Uh, let's, verse 4, Romans 1 and 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 5, here's another one, another term that has taken people for a loop. Verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. I'm going to read this again. This is Romans chapter 1, verse 5. He says, by whom we have received grace. So this word grace has taken people on a ride. And people who are, who, are, who are trained into the Greek way of life, they don't understand what grace means. So again, we're going to study the scriptures from the original Hebraic perspective. That old saying, if you want to get the story straight, get it straight from the horse's mouth. So if you want to understand this Hebrew Bible, you have to go back and get an understanding of the Hebrew language and the Hebrew culture. So let's take this word grace that is found in Romans uh, chapter 1 verse 5. If you Google uh, the word grace, I hope you can see it on this whiteboard here. The word grace comes from the Strong's H2580. Strong's H2580, you get the word for grace. The word for grace in the Hebrew, the transliteration right here says kin or con. Kin or con. So kin in the Hebrew, again, all the way over here towards the, the right, I hope you can see this. The Hebrew word for grace gives us the word con. And if you check the uh, Jeff Brenner if you don't have his lexicon, if you're trying to really do this study, and you're trying to learn for truth's sake, and you want to be in line with the Most High, it's a good tool to have. Jeff Brenner, his lexicon is awesome. This man did a wonderful job. Uh, so we take Strong's H25, and the word grace comes up as kin or con, right? So we take kin or con, and we tie it back to the original Hebrew. The original Hebrew letters for Khan, you get the picture, and I hope you can see it here, you get the picture of the tent wall. The first letter, Hebrew, if you don't know, Hebrew goes from right to left. The Greeks took everything and reversed it, and the Greeks read left to right. So the Hebrew, our forefathers, we read from right to left. So the Hebrew letter is Khan and Nun. So, Ka, oh, I'm sorry, Ka and Nu. Ka is the picture of the tent wall. And this right here, this is a sperm. This, this, is what, this is the icon of a sperm. This is the seed of a man. So, you have the tent wall and you have the seed of a man. Well, the tent wall protects the seed of a man. So, or inside the wall, inside the tent, the seed of the man is protected. So when we read the word grace, you get all kind of beautiful acronyms. Uh, I even subscribe to them. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Hallelujah. It sounds good. It sells t-shirts. It sells bumper stickers. But it's not lining up with scripture. If you go to the Hebrew lexicon, the word grace ties back to number 1175. And this is according to Jeff Brenner's lexicon, 1175. And the word grace means protection of the seed. The Most High is protecting a seed line. The Most High is protecting a certain seed line. 
And when you put scripture upon scripture or line upon line, you will see the seed line that he's protecting is the line of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, through the 12 tribes. That's the only seed line that's repeatedly uh, talked about in the New Testament. So you say, prove it. Well, it's many scriptures inside the New Testament that let you know that the seed line that the Bible is talking about is the line of Jacob. If you go to James chapter 1, verse 1, we went over this before. James 1 and 1, he says, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. It's always about the seed line of Jacob. If you go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, the same covenant or the same laws that the church tell you is done away with, the new covenant is made up of the same laws. And if you read uh, Hebrews 8 and 8, there's only, a, there's only one bloodline that are in covenant. It says with the house of Israel. He says with Jerusalem and Judah. So the new covenant that's coming is only made up of Judah and Jerusalem. So the new covenant that people think they're under hasn't started yet. When the new covenant do start, it's going to be the same Torah or the same laws and commandments that were given to Moses. And it's only covering the Israelites and it's covering those that the Israelites have in their houses. We'll get to that later, but again, I'm not excluding, or well, I'm not picking and choosing who's going into the Messiah's kingdom. I'm telling you that the Bible is saying the new covenant is for the house of Israel, and then whoever Israel has inside their homes or inside their gates will be covered by this covenant too. But the initial contract is between the Most High, the contract was sealed by the blood of the Messiah, and the contract is between the Israelites and the Messiah. Our king's blood, Yeshua, known to you, by you as Jesus Christ, to many of you, by Jesus Christ, has sealed the contract between the Israelites and the Most High. All praises to our Father. So let's get into more of Paul's letter and the language to show you that Paul knew he was talking to Hebrew Israelites. So... What we're going to do, we're going to save the more ambiguous verses for the end. We're going to go over the, just the, the easiest black and white verses first. And then all those confusing verses that the, um, the Greek mind or the Greek students have taken and twisted, we're going to save those for the end because that, that involves even more studies going back to the Torah, getting the root of the issue. So let's go over the, the verses in Romans that clearly shows you Paul is writing to Hebrew Israelites, right? So he says, um, where did we stop at? Verse 5. So if you're just tuning in, let's go over Romans 1 and 5 again. He says, by whom we have received grace. We just went over the word grace. Grace in the Hebrew means kin, and kin is the tent wall protects the seed. The Most High is protecting the seed of Abraham that came through Jacob. So he says, for obedience to the faith among all nations. He says, obedience to the faith among all nations. Well, what is the faith? The faith is not, not in the context of I hope or I got faith I'm going to get a job. No, the context of this word faith here is our faith system, our belief system. And the belief system of all the Israelites is the Most High made a covenant. He made promises to our father, starting with Abraham. And that, that promise was repeated throughout his bloodline. And that bloodline flowed through Isaac to Jacob. It skipped over Esau. That promise skipped over Esau and it went to Jacob. And that promise spread throughout Jacob's 12 sons. His 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. So he says, obedience to the faith, not faith, meaning I, have, I, I got faith I'm going to get a job. I got faith that I'm going to get a lot of money. No, obedience to the faith or obedience to our way of life. And then he says, uh, he finished up, for your obedience to the faith among all the nations. So again, if you don't know the Hebrew Israelite history, 
all this is over your head. When he says among all the nations, Hebrew Israelites were scattered all throughout Europe. We had Israelites scattered through all throughout Europe, and many of them didn't even know they were Israelites. We lost our identity way before the slave ships. We lost our identity back in the 700s BC. The northern kingdom of Israel was taken by the king of Assyria, and they never came back home. Their descendants became scattered, and they were raising their descendants. These people had no clue they were Hebrew Israelites. This is who Paul is writing to. Now, this letter to the Romans are the Israelites who are living at Rome. Let's dig deeper into the letter to show you how we know this. So, the next verse we're going to point out is, um, okay, let's, let's double back. So, he says to your obedience to the faith. Your obedience to the faith is our, our, our way of life. Obedience to the faith is the law, statutes, and commandments given to us by the Most High. So, let's go to Psalms 147. If you got your script, go to Psalms 147. For those of you who go to church and, and don't open your Bibles, it's shame on you that you allow these people to tell you any and everything. But we're going we're gonna to put precept upon precept. So, Psalms 147. Psalms 147, and we're going to start at verse 18. This is the faith that we follow, the Hebrew Israelites. He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters, and, and the waters flow. Verse 19. 